Some people never get their chance in the hot seat. Gareth Keenan, Kelly Rowland, Andrew Ridgely, Waylon Smithers, Spock, to name just a few. But with Will Perry on holiday with his mummy and John Wilkins mid-season transfer to sit on a bench with Jenna, I am the last man standing. But thankfully, I've got a friendly face to hold my hand. Um, so after many years of contributing very little, this boring man is in charge and your host. Welcome to episode 11 of Out of Your League. So here we have Kyle Amor, good friend of mine, new voice of Rugby League. How's it going? Yeah, brilliant flash. No pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward to, to speaking with our guest. Uh, we'll reveal him in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> how's, uh, how's retirement treating you? Yeah, no, really good. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been incredibly busy, so that's always been, that's always been a, uh, a huge help. But uh, in, terms of, in terms of playing, uh, don't miss that one bit at all. There's certain aspects, Flash, that I do miss, uh, but playing certainly isn't one of them. You know, my time was probably, you know, up, um, probably for many people might have said uh, 18 ten months. Years. <laughs> 18 <laughs> 10 years, months. I'll, go, I'll go 10 years. Uh, yeah, no, but look, again, yeah, excited with what's ahead and, uh, and looking forward to uh, uh, sinking my teeth into everything that's to come. And talk us through the decision. Was it injuries? Was it a lack, a lack of love for training and getting up for it? What was, what was the process behind it? Oh, look, you know, I think when I, when I stepped away from, from full-time at St. Helens, um, I think once, once that had happened, I, I, act, I really loved and I really cared about St. Helens. I loved being a St. Helens player. Uh, I loved the club and I loved all the teammates as well. And once I stepped away from that, I think, a, a, you know, as cheesy as it sounds, a small piece of me sort of died in terms of loving the game. Uh, obviously went over to, went over to Warrington, uh, hopeful that I could, you know, bring a little bit of what I felt that they might have needed at that time. But it, it, it you know, it's truth be told, I, th I think, you know, mentally, once you make that decision that, that, that you don't, it's very, very difficult to, to recapture that love for it and, and, and apply yourself properly. So, you know, again, all the players at Warrington were, were fantastic. The club were great as well, the coach, um, but, it was just, uh, it was a difficult time for everybody at Warrington. Uh, a lot of people wanted the season over, a lot of the players did, a lot of the fans did. Uh, and it kind of, you know, it, it got to a stage where, you know, I had mentioned on a on a previous podcast where it got to a stage where I just, yeah, I, I just wasn't, I wasn't really interested in playing uh, at that level. And I don't think I was applying myself properly at that level either. So uh, I took the decision to, to, to step away uh, and then Widness came in and, Again, they showed you the money, did they? Well, yeah, look, Flash. At the end of the day, there was there was a little bit of that. There was a little bit of that, and uh, you know, transitioning out of full time sport is incredibly difficult. It really is, and you've got to almost imagine that it's like being back at school again. You, you, you've got a you've got like a sixteen year old kid, but this time he was thirty six, asking him, "What do you want to do with the rest of your life?" And and you know, at times it spirals out of control, and you feel like you don't really know who you are anymore you don't know what you want to do you don't know what you want to be and you kind of go into desperation mode where you know you'll just grab anything that's that, that comes your way just to make a means for your family um you know i'd i'd planned you know i've just finished as qualified as a teacher now in high school so i'd planned my exit out of the game you know i'd done my degree knew that i was going into teacher training but it was still very very daunting it was very daunting to go away from, uh, you know, something that I absolutely love doing in playing the game and being around all the boys to to this different role where, you know, I'm stood in, in front of a classroom teaching teaching high school kids. And, um, you know, while it's been brilliant and I've enjoyed it, uh, again, it was just, you know, you just, you, you, it's very difficult to explain until you've actually walked a mile yeah. in them shoes. Well, and I, sure I did it a few years ago and I can, I can testify to what you're saying. It's, it's very, it's, you kind of become institutionalised with the, the club, the sport, with what you do for half your life. And then it's one day you do it, one day you don't. But the thing, the thing that helped me was, was during lockdown, we had four or five months of not going to training. Mm. And I think it was easier transition because mm. I was kind of half used to not, not mm. being training every day. And I think, made it a bit easier for me, but I, you know, I know what you're like in, in around training and how passionate you are about rugby and, and being with the boys. And I can imagine it was, it was, it was pretty tough. Well, one of the, one of the things I related it to my mates was, you know, I remember being back up in Cumbria and talking to my mates and I was saying that, 
to them, a couple of them are bricklayers and a couple of them work at Sellafield. Now, I'd just use this analogy. I said to the boys, imagine that you're, you know, that it could be tomorrow, it could be next week, it could be six months' time. You've been a bricklayer for 20 years, but at any given moment, you'll have to wake up the next day and not be able to lay a brick ever again. What do you do? And they were all like, I don't know. And that's exactly what it's like playing sport. You know, you're that used to the training, you know, everything's provided for you. You get spoiled in so many ways, but you've earned the right to be spoiled, I think, as well, you know. Um, but, you know, it's very, very difficult. And and to be honest, I'm still, I still haven't quite worked it out 100% yet. I still don't know, uh, you know, what exactly I'm going to do. I have that teaching qualification in my back pocket. That was something I always wanted to set out to do. Uh, but I'm moving away from that. I've got another role coming up, another opportunity that's, you know, that excites me. Um, so, again, I don't know if that's going to be where I'm going in the next two or three years. But, um, you know, that's something that I've still got to figure out. Yeah. And uh, a testimonial at the minute? Yeah. yeah. How's that going? Do you want to give it a plug? <laughs> no, no, it's all Go right. on, you can. You've got 10 <laughs> seconds to go. No, no, it's all good. No, look, obviously we've got our game, uh, Cumbria v Wales. So if you're in the Should area, get yourself to that. Where's it at? Uh, it's at Whitehaven, back in my hometown. So, um, you know, the, the, the people of Cumbria Flash, is, as anyone who knows in the game, are incredibly passionate about rugby league and you know it's uh, a little bit of ego in there he's, he's, he's excited to go full circle from where it all started and finish it there and um, you know again and, and, and that's been one of those other things that's kept me busy Flash and, and, and when I was at Widness again I, you know there was a, a shoulder and a knee injury that was niggling away and it was getting harder and harder to sort of you know uh, get out training properly and you know the Widness club they train three nights a week uh, Added to that, running the testimonial, added to that, doing the media, added to that, doing the teacher training, and then somehow in there trying to do my main job, which is being a father and a husband as well. So it just got a little bit all on top of me in the end. And and, and unfortunately, uh, playing rugby league once again came to the bottom of my priorities. And I'm aware that, that, that there's a common trait happening here. It happened at Warrington, it happened at Widness. But again, I have to stress that that when you are at that stage of retirement and you don't want to retire, you know, it, it's it's very, very difficult. And uh, you have to go through experiences to fully iron out what it is that's going on in your mind. And and for me, you know, almost clawing on to play in the game was, was just how I dealt with it. Is it right? I don't know, but it was right to me at that moment in time. So... Uh, but now I know that that's it, you know, um, that, 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 that I'm done. Right, good stuff. Well, you, well, I played with you and I can testify that you were, you, you put everything into us playing at Saints and you were, you're, you're a decent team, mate. Uh, <laughs> now the viewers and listeners will be glad to know it's not just me and you waffling along for the next hour or so. We've got a great guest. Um, so this guy is a former Panther, Cowboy, Saints, Robin, and for many Saints fans, he is the reason. <laughs> One of a few men to be a grand final winner in both Super League and the NRL. Please, Kyle, give it up for Lachlan Coote. Fantastic. Give us a bit. Give us a whoop. Ooh, give us a whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> How are you doing, pal? Are you okay? I'm very good. Thanks for having me on. How was how was Kyle during your time at Saints and vice versa, actually? Uh, slow. slow. No. <laughs> With a good little jink at the line. Good little jink in the line, a little show and go every but now slow. and then. But, but, but slow. slow. Nah, he was great. Um, good to have around. Good to have the experience. Um, Always spoken well every time. Didn't just speak for the sake of saying things. Um, always spoke every time he spoke, people listened. So it was good to have him there. Good to have his experience. Look, I think there's no coincidence that Lachlan Coote came over. You know, um, and many of us were wondering how the void of, uh, of Ben Barber and what he did. You know, Ben Barber, what he did in them first ten rounds is is something that. I've never really seen a player do. I don't he think was, anything would be repeated. Like no, that. no, he was he was incredible. Like uh, you know, and then. Um, Towards the end of Benny's time, he, he kind of head got turned with the NRL and then, you know, his performances did dip. But those 10, first 10, 15 rounds, wow, what a player. And a lot of us were sort of thinking, well, how can he be replaced? Well, you know, Lachlan Coote comes along and there's no coincidence how, you know, that first season in 2019, we, you know, we, we blew teams away literally 
before half time. Uh, and, you know, it was the beginning of what you see now, I think. And and I think you know, the reason he is called the reason is because he was the reason. Do you know, he was he was he was he was part of that. Uh, a lot of ingredients came together, flash at the right time. I think you'll, you, you'll yeah, vouch for I that as well. So. But it all had to be managed. It all had to be uh, it all had to be organised, delivered on on the training field as well as off it. And you know, Cootie just came in, and his standards and his behaviours was what the group needed at that time. And and there was a couple of others there along the way as well that it was part of that leadership group, if you like. And uh, yeah, what he was able to achieve there, fantastic. Yeah, I think from as a, I, we played in the in the grand final in 2019, and we at Salford all recognise you as probably the general at the back. There's not always fullbacks that kind of command that that general mindset where they kind of dictate play and obviously the numbers and, and where you attack. But I think you kind of were instrumental in that, that spine with Johnny and Robes and Tio. And um, yeah, from the outside looking in, I, I was I was ma massively impressed with, with the, the impact you had on Saints. No, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the kind words. And I was just um, coming in to do my job. And I think at my time, I like just Justin Holbrook always said it but always being calm under pressure and I didn't think it at the time but I'll, I'll probably look back now and that's probably what I bring to the team and I think that's probably what Saints needed to have. And that comes experience as well I don't mm, think definitely if you're a young guy I think when you're in a big moment you can rush it or you can just act on instinct but if you've been there and done it you can take a moment pause yeah and, and, and being calm is key. Being calm yeah and and uh, I think like in those situation we had like, I had the players around me and I was fortunate enough and like Kyle said the stars aligned um, with me coming into the the team but obviously they say that I'm the reason but <laughs> I was just lucky to be a part of something really special um, and and having the players around me made me who I was and the, like, I played my best footy at Saints and um, and at KR obviously in dribs and drabs obviously injuries uh, have played a part in that but um, but yeah, like having the players around you definitely make you a, b a better player. And that's at Saints, that's what I, what I had. Yeah, sure was. Now let, let's go back to a young Lachlan. So you grew up in Windsor, which is, is that near Penrith? Yep. Can you paint a picture to, to, to the viewers and, and, and Kyle and I, what, what, you, what your upbringing was like, what your childhood was like? Were you, were you footy mad from a young age? Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, footy mad from a young age. I, I started in, um, I'm, first I'll start with, I'm, I'm one of seven. So we've got, we've got to have four. No five, TV in yeah, your house. No, no TV in ours. There's a, there's a story behind that, but we might leave that bit of religion as well. So, but um, that, that goes real deep. Um, but we'll leave that alone. Um, one of seven, five boys, two girls, um, and yeah, mum and dad were were awesome. I don't know how they how they really did it, um, getting us to. We all played sport. We're all um, yeah, sport mad. We had obviously a couple playing soccer or fo footy. Um, couple playing rugby league, one playing AFL, girls played netball, dance, and um, yeah, we were all pretty active um, when, we, when we were younger. But I started out in uh, football, soccer, and um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to, I'll stick with football. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, played that for two years in under sixes, sevens, and then I think I got a bit too rough for, for <laughs> um, and I was looking at my older brothers as well. They, they were sort of inspiring me. My oldest brother, Cameron, always looked up to him and he played rugby league so uh, I wanted to do what he's, he did and follow in his footsteps and um, yeah went over to rugby league from from an, from when I was eight years old. So, so were you the, the youngest out of all the brothers? And I was youngest out of all the brothers and I've had a younger sister and I think that's probably played a massive part of why I've been so competitive and, and probably successful as well. I, you don't really know how it all pans out until you get older and you start to realise like patterns and stuff like that and you start to realise who you are as a person and, and what made you are what made you where you are today. I think youngest in families and I, I'm assuming were you quite small as a kid as well? Uh biggish. Boy were you yeah, like a lot like I just never grew. And I was going <laughs> to say, so, when did you stop growing? Yeah, <laughs> I stopped growing. It's I been stopped this growing. Side since we were five. So when I was like I'm talking in terms of like probably from eight years old to like 15 or something like that I was I was probably biggish and then um yeah just sort of stopped growing <laughs> you mentioned <laughs> you your brother see. there Cameron what was it that what was it that he you said you looked up to him a lot besides mm. playing rugby league what was it that he was doing that, that that made you want to sort of follow in his footsteps well I don't know like I think just always to have that competitive nature 
it was always to try and beat my brothers at everything. And whether that was punching on or something like that <laughs> together, or I always wanted to beat them. And then with my older brothers, like even with cross, cross country at school or athletics at school, like they went to um, regional or state, they were versing, um, running for state cross country. And then I always, I don't know what it was, but I was, I was goal setting without actually goal setting of like, okay, um, Cameron and Carl, my brothers, they made state cross country when they were in year um, seven or something like that. So I wanted to make st state cross country in year seven. I know um, my other brother, Carl, he, he played in a f um, division one for Windsor Wolves um, under 16s grand final and they, they won it. So I was like, okay, well, I want to, I want to be there and I want to achieve that. So I think just from that, and I actually did achieve that. We won under 16s Division One Grand Final for Windsor Wolves. So, just those little things have have yeah definitely made me who I am today, and and probably why I've been successful in 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 a rugby league career. And is goal setting something that you've that, that you've continued to do all throughout your career? Like you said, you've adopted it right at an early age without realizing. Are you were uh, were you a big goal setter, Flash, as well? Um, I think I was. I think you have to be in a way. I think you, if you, you're aimless if you haven't got goals. Mm. And I, I, I probably set my goals a bit too high. I wanted to be an international, I wanted to win Man of Steel. But I always thought if I aim for that, I won't go far wrong yeah, if I don't yeah, quite yeah. get yeah. there. You're better off aiming, be more ambitious than, than your talent mm. suggests, really. And yeah, I think, I think you've got to be. How mm. about yourself? Yeah, no, look, I, you know, obviously, you know, my route into the game was very, very different. You know, obviously played amateur for a long time at open age and then got the opportunity at Whitehaven. It was never really, you know, I always had ambition, but I always had to sort of reassess my goals at every new level that I found, you know. So once I got to, you know, once I got to uh, Whitehaven, it was just about playing an excellent amount of games and making sure that, that, that I didn't embarrass myself as daft as that sounds. And then when I got to Leeds, it was about, you know, playing again so many games. And once you got to Wakefield, I then turned it into a front, what front row was doing. A little bit embarrassing to say it, but you know it had to be. You know, I wanted to make over 100 meters a game, and I, and I knew that if I was doing them sorts of things, that sooner or later I'd get recognised and I'd keep improving, and and bigger clubs would come back for me, which they did at Saints, and then it became. The goals then became around winning trophies. You know, once you get to St Helens, if you don't want to w win trophies, then it, you, you, you shouldn't really be there, should you? So, um, but yeah, just thought about goal setting. Is that something that you that you've done? It's actually something that I wish I'd done more of, yeah. and I didn't actually go really into depths like that, like in terms of I don't know, try assist or hundred. Mm. Like my my biggest one was always around um, su um, supports as a fullback. You always want to be the best supporter, so it was always up around. Um, I don't know, 20, 20 odd supports a game and stuff like that. And that's, and I knew if I was getting around then, I would be in, in, in the mix and, and around the game and involved more. So, um, but yeah, I wish I did more. I think the biggest thing for me or learning curve for me was my, my ultimate goal was to play NRL. And a, a mate just sent me a, <laughs> sent me a photo of um, our year six um, like folder of what we writ and what what we want to achieve when we when we grow up and it was to play for the Pembroke Panthers. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's crazy and I don't, don't even remember yeah. sort of writing that, but I knew I was I wanted to play NRL at some stage. And then the biggest thing for me was that was my ultimate goal. And when I achieved that goal, I I sort of got lost in a way. Yeah, uh, I I got there and I didn't understand. Like I didn't realize I was goal setting, but I was without without realizing. Mm -hmm. And when I actually got there, I was like, oh, I've made it. Yeah. And then like. You know, I got lost, lost, lost in my professional career a little bit, yeah. and then yeah, found my feet again. Yeah, I think sometimes you probably need good people around you to try, or a new coach, or to kind of mm. put some belief into you that you can go on to that next level as well. I think that can be important. Now, going back to your family, so seven, you were one of seven. Now, your was it your grandma is Scottish? Yep. You talk us through your grandma because when you first played for Scotland, I was like, how the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. If you can, <laughs> can you tell us a bit about Aussie that? as they come. Um, yeah, no, it would. I, I don't know too much about my grandma and, and like I said at the start of the podcast, um, there's, a, there's a story around our religion and stuff like that and how obviously no TV and all that kind of stuff. Um, but so there's, a, yeah, there's not too much to know about my grandma, but obviously she was born in, born in Glasgow, um, went, to, went to Australia when she was 17. Was she one of the 10 pound poms? Yeah, must have been, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd say. And then, yeah. Um, yeah, and then that's how that sort of come about. So. There is a, a, we used to see grandma and grandpa growing up a little bit, but yeah. um, not enough to sort of know 
much history about yeah. about it all. So, if you don't mind me asking, then um, the Scotland representing Scotland was that something that you felt that that that, that you you had to do that you wanted to do. Or was it a case like a lot of other players is that there was an international opportunity to play on the international stage and that, and that you're taking it through the grandparent route? Yeah, I think it was, uh, yeah, realising that, um, you know, I probably passed the days of playing Origin and, and making Australia and um, there was an opportunity there. Kane Lynette at the time, we were both playing at Cowboys mm -hmm. and, and he just recently played um, in the World Cup for Scotland. Um, and then... There was, I just, it was just a, a, a rough, like, we're just having a laugh about yep. it. And I realised that my grandma was Scottish and I said, oh, I wonder if I could, I could play. And um, so straight away he was, Kane, Kane was onto it, texting the, obviously the management of the, of the Scottish Rugby League and, and finding out how to, how to go about that I could get in. But to answer your question, it was just about um, playing in an international on an yeah. international stage. Yeah. And how so. was that? Because the Scots are a very proud people, aren't they? Mm. And I'm sure you've been up there and travelled and been to Glasgow. And was there any initiation ceremonies with haggis and whiskey? Was the <laughs> was the kilt wearing? There was kilt wearing with uh, no jocks on. Yeah. Um, that was a rule. So I had to wear that. But um, yeah, it was pretty cool. And I'm glad that I actually did it. I, I think I had my, my worst year was at Cowboys. Um, just finished... 2016 it was so mm -hmm. um that was probably the the worst year that i had there um in in terms of performance and and mental state as well just trying to um obviously battle with coaches and all that kind of stuff and i sort of fell out of love with the game and um going to scotland and uh, to play for scotland and and then coming over here that the the four nations tour was in england at the time and um that was the best thing that ever happened to me i think i, I come to a, um, a team with a, a, a good group of lads um, and it, there was no pressure, there was no nothing. We're like, you know, we're the, we're the fourth nation, we got invited. So there was no pressure on us to, to perform in any way. Um, and that was the, the good thing about it, um, probably because I was probably under pressure in, in that whole year coming off the back of 2015 grand final, winning for Cowboys and stuff. And um, so there was a lot of pressure going into that 2016 season. So yeah, it was an awesome experience, and um, I think there's some sort of record there to say that you know we're, we're the best fourth nation to be invited. That <laughs> well, in performance-wise, you so. played England, Australia, and then you, you. I'm sure I went to the game at work. Yeah, and you drew with New Zealand. We drew with New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was incredible. Yeah. That was incredible. <laughs> had a decent side though as well, didn't you? Yeah, we had a good side. Luke yeah, Douglas, so. Luke Luke Douglas, Douglas play. big Luke Douglas, uh, Kane Adam Lynette. Walker, Adam well. Walker, yeah. Um, Matty Russell, uh, Matty Russell, yeah. uh, um, Danny Addy, Addy was playing, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, Bruffy as well. Oh yeah, uh, Danny yeah. Bruff. That's a decent side, though. Yeah, it is a really good side. And I can imagine, you know, when you're playing at the top and it's very stressful, as as it would be in the NRL, you can get bogged down with detail and pressure and targets every week. But just letting the shackles off and enjoying your rugby, it can be such so, so, so reinvigorating in someone's career. And I know you, you you did quite a lot with Ireland. I'm sure you probably did this did the same. Yeah, look for us. I remember the obviously the 2017 World Cup. We just look, look we knew we weren't going to win the World Cup, so we may as well have a good time while we were doing it, right? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So you know, and, and we, had a, we had a, we had a great time. We had a great time. It was almost uh, we we nicknamed it the Stag Do. You know, it who was, was the Stag? Uh, Anthony Mawali. Yeah. <laughs> so big mole Stag Do. But no, no. Look, we we, we made sure that every day we were tra we training. We were never late to training. We always made sure we were ripped in in games, and we did. We you know we beat we beat Italy. Uh, you know we came. We were we were so close uh, in Papua New Guinea to knocking Papua New Guinea out, and we'd have got to a quarter final. We beat Wales in that World Cup. I still somehow scratch my head. Samoa drew two games or, or, or drew one game, lost two, went through, we won two and and we, we didn't get to go through like <laughs> rugby league for you all over in there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, not that I'm bitter, but no, you don't sound <laughs> it. it's not like you, but, Kyle. No, no. But look, yeah, I, I think it's so important. I, I think we've got to a place now where by and large, if you put everybody, every player in Super League on a yo-yo test, I think the majority of people would would hit an average score. Yes, you'd always get your, your you know, your James Robies who'd, who'd be running all day and you'd get your some of your bigger lads who'd maybe drop out early on. Do you want to on. name a few of the bigger lads? 
Well, Mossy Musso. Well, yeah, big, big, moss. big Moss. Big Moss. Big Moss. But what I'm saying is, is nowadays, with, with, with all the, you know, the, the, the sports science, with the, you, you know, the number of S&C staff, with all the equipment that's there, I think pretty much is everybody at that level where everybody's near enough as fit as each other, but where they probably not, is mentally you talk about taking the shackles off and i think the team that the, the teams that are mentally excited or prepared or whatever you want to call it to go out on a friday night the ones who are in the best headspace they're the ones who they're the ones who, who I achieve things the know? happiest teams are the most successful teams mm. uh, for last, you you guys have been at saints for for the, the most successful running super league history i reckon knowing quite a few of those lads, that was a happy dressing room. You knew when to have a good time. Yeah. You knew when to work hard. Yeah. You obviously had talent, you had big, strong players, you had, you had all the ingredients, but you were a happy camp, probably made more so by Holbrook and, and Christian Wolf, who kind of facilitated that. But you had a happy team who enjoyed each other's company, who would go out on a Friday night and they'd bash, it, bash the opposition just for the mate next to them. Yeah, yeah, that goes 100%. so far. Yeah. And I think that's what I've learned to realise how much of a coach has an influence on the players. And I, and I go back to sort of my Cowboys days and there was a lot of pressure around that stuff. But I refer to Justin Holbrook, like just the most positive bloke I've ever met as a coach. And like I'll, I'll go back to the story of me coming to um, Saints first. My first game, we're, we're playing Wigan and I think we're what was it, t um, six, ten or something, at, um, going into half time, and I threw an intercept, and um, at the time, I can't remember who it was, um, who ran the length of the field and scored. And we went into um, into half time, and Justin Holbrook done his round, talking to all the players, asking how they were and how they were feeling about the first half. And he come to me, and I, like, I, was, I was a bit nervous at the time, because I'd, you know, I'd just come off the back of like, sort of cowboys and a coach and stuff who's sort of put you under a, a, a bit of pressure about those sort of sorts of things. And he just said to me, he said, because oh, I said, oh, I apologise. I was like, oh, sorry, mate, you know, not the best pass, best pass selection or something like that. And, and he just said, mate, he was guessing. He didn't know what, what he was doing. You, if you threw the ball, it was hit and miss and he was guessing and, and he ended up coming up with the play. And then like, I just, like, it was like a massive relief. And then to that day, I just, I still think like, a coach has a massive influence on a player. Yeah, that can that can go one of two ways. That you can either go in your shell mm. after a bollocking from your coach, or you can maybe feel a bit taller going out into the second half and and backing yourself because those opportunities can come again, can't they? Yeah, definitely. And you've got to be able to back yourself, and a coach needs to to back you to to go with your instinct there. Yeah, hundred percent. Now, just going back to your, your NRL career. So, um, you're at Pen, Penrith as a teenager, and then you debuted in two thousand and eight. How how were those early years for you at Penrith? Uh, unreal. Um, everything and more I thought it would be. Um, I think I yeah, went out for my debut, Best had all my family, all the supporters there, that uh, friends and family and stuff like that. And I think on, the, on my debut after I got, I got man of the match and I thanked all, my, I thanked, I thanked all my fans when, I, when it was my debut. And <laughs> I want to thank I still all get, my fans. <laughs> <laughs> 20,000 fans. <laughs> yeah. I think it was 20. 20 um 20 fans i had um but yeah it was it was unreal um and we ended up going extra time and and drawing um against um a, the broncos team so and that was at penrith that home. was a penrith home ground yeah do you so. know who else was in that crowd that day kyle amor kyle amor were you yeah, yeah. oh really we've spoken yeah. about this yeah, we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What were you wade doing? graham yeah. he made his debut with wade you, graham was the week before well, i there? think it was origin wasn't it yeah it was around so origin, are you trying yeah. to get a, tra a train and trial no contract? no 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 <laughs> i was there part of the cumbrian amateur team we, oh, we yeah. played uh York, yorkshire lancashire in like a tri nations or tri series whatever you want to call it and whoever won that got to go to australia so we went out to australia based in penrith for three weeks we watched you guys train we watched you uh and then the week after might have been you play Parramatta. did you play in that game uh, I probably would have, yeah. yeah so I think we went so. and watched that game as well. And Can't remember. I remember you had a training session. We all watched, and uh, somehow Trent Waterhouse's jersey that he put in the bin ended up in my suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> somehow, <laughs> accidentally, on purpose. Do you know what's interesting? That you know, always getting stuff signed, aren't you? Mate? <laughs> <laughs> you talk about like careers and like different trajectories. Well. That couldn't be any more different. At 20 years old, you're making your debut, getting around in the match. And Kyle, with all respect, you're on an amateur tour with your Cumbrian team and 
to say you two won a, won a grand final together, it's mm. it's quite cool though. It is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and more, more young men should yeah. know that. They don't have to be in scholarships and be in academies to get to where they want to get to. Some people's paths are different as long as you kind of got the right mindset and yeah. you, you work hard and you've got a bit about it. You, you can you can still get because you would have been what how old would you been there? Uh, two, 2008, so I'd have been 19, maybe yeah. 19, 20 year old. So a lot of lads might think they missed Mate. the boat at that mm -hmm. age. How old are you now? Yeah, 36. Oh, and so the rest. Do the maths. Um, mm -hmm. I was 18. So how old are you? I'm 33. So you'd have been 21. You're 20 21 then. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. 21. <laughs> yeah, but most lads would have think. They've missed the chance. Missed the chance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like you say, sometimes as well, you need luck along the way. Sometimes yeah. you're at the right place, right time, all yeah. that sort of stuff. So, yeah. yeah you make your own luck, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so a couple of good years at Penrith. So, you were there till 2013. What what brought about the, the move up to the Cowboys? Uh, I just think uh, I had a... Since I've, I've never had a bad injury my whole junior career, um, as soon as I made my NRL debut, then it all bloody come crashing down so since like being there for five years um i had you know pec shoulders groins all the injuries medial ligaments and i didn't I know think, you had any pecs <laughs> <laughs> there is some there I used, to. I used to have two uh... <laughs> only just um but yeah for that five years i think i only played like 83 games so and i think at the every time i played it was the thing I wanted to focus my football around was being, being consistent, but every time I was on the field, I was I was playing decent footy, but I just wasn't on the field enough. And I yeah. think when Ivan Cleary come along, um, he probably realised that. And, you know, they had it, obviously, Penrith, great juniors, great people, and there's always juniors coming through. Like, they've got a massive amount of selection, who they can choose, pick and choose, and they're all quality players. So I was lucky and lucky that I was there for that long. Um, really, so um, yeah, and I think Ivan Cleary coming through. Um, we had a, a few young fullbacks with Matty, Matthew Moylan, um, Lizette, Liz, oh well, Lizette, <laughs> I'm gonna Watini, I'll oh. say, I'll say, and um, I think he's playing for uh, Kiwis, uh, the yeah. New Zealand team. Dallin at the moment. Yeah, that's it, Dallin. Mm -hmm. um, and they were all coming through, so. I had an opportunity to go to the Cowboys, um, which I was thankful enough. They were, Matty Bowen was moving on, signed with Wigan, um, but and then um, yeah, to to be like I would have been silly not to take that opportunity. Yeah, uh, for a fullback, look, yeah, to be playing with one of the best halves of all time in Jonathan Thurston. Yeah. Michael Morgan was, I think he was probably coming through at that he time. He was coming through, yeah, yeah, and he was obviously played for Australia, played Origin. For a fullback, you'd be licking your lips thinking you could build Mate, a combination with those I, guys. I couldn't believe that the opportunity came up. Like, yeah. And yes, it was my junior career and that's all I wanted to do was play for Penrith Panthers. And I think, um, and you know, my time there was awesome. But to move on and to go and have that opportunity to play under Jonathan Thurston and, and, and the forward pack that we had, we had like Matt Scott. Um, Tom Lolo. Yeah, Tom, Tom. Um, So they were all there to run off the back of and... I just, yeah, I jumped at the opportunity. Just on that there, so, sorry, just to step back one, um, when you had to leave Penrith Panthers, obviously being from Windsor, you know, as local, pretty local to the club mm. as you can be, what was the feel? what was your overriding feeling once the decision was made that you were going to leave that club? Yeah, well, it was, and I'll probably contradict myself a little bit, um, I was sad at the time, and yeah, like you said, like, born and bred, it was my junior club, that's all I wanted to play for, and to be able to, to say that, you know, they're not going to re-sign me anymore, um, you know, was a was a hard hard to sort of take at the time, young fella. Um, I think I was, yeah, 23 at the time. So, but then again, looking back now, it's easier to say, well, great decision. But yeah, at the time it was hard to move on. Um, but then again, yeah, like we, the opportunity to jump at playing under Thurston was, was a great opportunity. Now, talk us through the first couple of years, though. So, 2014 was your first year at the Cowboys, and then 2015 built up to the crescendo of the grand final, which was one of the most amazing <laughs> spectacles you'll ever see. I remember watching it. I think it was one Mad Monday. I was like, cross-eyed in the pub. <laughs> Hasn't he just done that? Yeah. Talk us through those two years. Unbelievable. Um, well, yeah, it wasn't a great start to my Cowboys career. Um, 
I moved up there and, and yeah, a bit nervous at the time to try and film Matty Bowen's shoes. Um, obviously, was never going to do that. And uh, a local local junior um, up there and, and what he'd done for the game of rugby league, not only for the Cowboys, but in rugby league itself and the Indigenous community too. So he's done unbelievable things within the game. Um, it was it was a bit nerve-wracking going up there to try and go, OK, well, this uh, little white kid from Windsor <laughs> um, try and try and do your best um, but then yeah it wasn't off to a great start we it was the first year the um, the nines come in uh, over in um, in New Zealand so um, went over there done my ACL in I think the the first game we played oh, yeah. so that was yeah very very depressing <laughs> time of my career um, knowing that you know I wasn't being able to to um, perform that whole year but then again um, with all adversity whatever you get through makes you stronger obviously the sayings and stuff like that but it, it definitely did um, it was it was probably the best thing that sort of happened to me in a way and I always say to Michael Morgan I made his career because my ACL I done my ACL so. <laughs> did he come in at fullback then? he come in at oh, fullback okay. so he was always I think he's always played in the halves yeah. through his junior career and, and then he come at fullback um, Paul Green yeah Gave him the opportunity to um, put him in at fullback, and mate, what a what a career! Uh, what a what a, a year for him! Unbelievable, yeah. And so for that full year, you were on the sidelines, and then the next year, you would have been coming, trying to get back into the team, trying to get fully fit, trying to prove your point, and then that kind of built up to the to the, the massive success you had. Yeah, so that was hard. It was a, a tough slog for the year because I just I just come off the back of a, a pec tear. Um, so a pec tear at Penrith. At Penrith. Straight into so ACL. So round two, done my pec. Round two um, in the 2013 season, tore my pec off the bone, had to get that reattached, surgery, everything, all the lot, and then got back in round 22, I think, and then played the last four seasons, uh, four games, sorry. And then, yeah, went back in, in straight into the pre-season, done a, a, probably the best pre-season I've ever done. Um back then and big strong fast and then went into the nines comp not i wouldn't Jesus. say big but probably strong <laughs> i wouldn't say big yeah that year that you that you went on to win the grand final you know you talked about the pre-season that you had and and the condition you felt in but you started the season in the q cup didn't you yeah you know, so so you know i think that's you talk about different pathways into the, the game and success well what a story that is mm. it starts off in the q cup and wins the grand final later on in that year. There's, there's a lot of lessons in there for any youngster who's playing the game now, or or any any teammate of yours to you know. Because yeah. at times, don't you? At times when you're not being selected, or you're perhaps feeling a bit out of form, you have to play the long game in rugby league, don't yeah. you? You have to just trust that that there is an opportunity. There's always an opportunity for you somewhere down the line if you just stay with it. And that's and that's exactly what happened. Like and like I was getting to, I had like a, a 12 month preseason and. Like I said, it was the best thing that happened to me. It made me strong, resilient with all those, um, with all the training that we did. I got on the, I was in my lycra and everything, bike, biking up Castle Hill, Mount Stewart, um, done all that. And all that training definitely made that season next. And like you said, I, I started out in the Q Cup for the first two rounds, I think it was, or first three maybe, um, and then back in, in, in round four. I had the exact same story as you. So in 2013, we played Hull KR away. And I tore my ACL with a cannonball tackle. Con Miko playing for uh, he KL. Him. Did he? Yeah. Well, I was stood up in a tackle. And it was before it was outlawed. And he came from the side, took my leg from under me. And I snapped my ACL. I was out for the season. So 2014 pre-season, I thought I was training the house down. But Nathan Brown was like, no, you're coming back off an ACL. You need to play dual reg for, for a bit to get your fitness up. And I was fuming. <laughs> so I went and played for Rochdale for the first three rounds of the season. And... After the first game, I thought, I'll play a game and I'll get back. Second game, I'm still with Rochdale. Third game, we Rochdale. We play Featherstone away. I was playing back row and my halfback was taking all kinds of tablets before the game to <laughs> calm his anxiety. <laughs> it was ridiculous. He was like a rock star. We got beat by about 50. And I was that was the lowest point in my career. Yeah, yeah. I was like, how am I ever going to get back to this level? So I went, went to the petrol station, got about 10 cans of Guinness, <laughs> went home, drowned my sorrows, and then that week, someone had an injury and I was back in first team and then I played the rest of the year and we won the grand final. 
But it's just, but sometimes you've kind of just got to keep the faith, just haven't got you? Just got to keep the faith, yeah. You've just got to stay with it. Trust your gut. Trust well, that, your, after trust that, after that nines comp, that was, like you said, a low point. Talk about a low point. But mm. there was this fella that just come to the Cowboys as well, Andrew Kroll, um, and he was the best person to work under. Um, just full of energy. Every day was a, was a good day, and it didn't matter how you were feeling or anything. And that's that's who got me through. So he was he was a legend. You talked about a low point there, Cooey. Obviously, we're going to carry on talk about the rest of your, your your career. Would you say that that was one of the lowest points in your career? What what, what point would you did you feel that? Uh yeah. I, I just when that happened, I didn't know. The good thing about it, I I did sign a three year deal, so yeah. I was so I was happy time. in that. I had yeah. time and I had security and all that kind of stuff. So fortunate enough that that happened, but. It was a point where I'm like, what, are, why, what am I doing? Why am I continuing to play this game? And there is a few, definitely a few more times where I've felt like that as well throughout my career after that stage. Mm. So, and I'm just, yeah, I'm just happy that, it, you know, I've stuck with it and, and got through that adversity, adversity and yeah, better yeah, and for it. Yeah, and you, you re reaped all the rewards that season. So 2015 grand final, can you talk us through that? Because I watched the highlights the other day and there was a moment where you nearly kicked the, the winning drop goal. I think it was between you and first and <laughs> set up at the back. But talk us through that game because it was unbelievable for anybody who hasn't seen it. Yeah, it was just it, um, it was just a massive roller coaster. I think it was like the career the career of um, of rugby league in mm. in one eighty minute or ninety minute game. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was a, an unreal feeling um, to to be able to win it. But what we went through in that game and I, it was an, an off it was one of the hottest days ever as well like i say ever a bit of exaggeration but <laughs> australia, <laughs> australia gets <laughs> australia gets pretty hot but the the air was just still there was so much humidity and it was a, a tough game to to be a part of um and to be able to sort of get back the way we did i thought the game was like at the back end of that um, Broncos were looking to, to kick the ball out every time I was standing on the sideline trying to receive the ball um, to, to obviously speed the game up and get back into it um, but like I had nothing left I, I was and I and I, at a point I thought that I was just like this is it like this is what it feels like to, to lose a grand final at a, in, in a stage in that game and I thought there was no way that we could we could get back um, because everyone was at a stage where we were just all out on our feet. There was no plays being called. It was just like... Survival do, mode. Yeah, survival mode. And obviously you use, um, experience those moments where you're just in survival mode and you're just trying to create something from nothing and usually it doesn't work. And in an off occasion, this, it, it worked. So what moment in that game, what moment in that game did you either think, right, We've got a chance here, or the or the moment. I'm I'm, I'm assuming you're gonna say Thurston's drop goal, right? <laughs> but what what moment? If you could if you could if you could bottle it all up and just open that lid up in in whenever, which first moment comes out that you'll always remember? And it might be well, it, you know it could be something completely different, couldn't it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What 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 moment? It was um, it was on the Hooter. Michael Morgan. There was Michael Morgan. Like there was nothing Jonathan, on there. There was, was nothing on. Jonathan Thurston broke about 17 tackles, um, bounced out, looked to pass to me, but realised he's not going to he's not going to create not anything. <laughs> he's gone. So where's Michael Morgan? And I think Michael Morgan created those moments through that whole year, that whole season. Um, we found ways to win, and um, more often than not, it was Michael Morgan in those moments. So I think I don't know why Thurston at the time under fatigue, everything. Find Michael Morgan, and I think he's he's said it in one of his um, uh, interviews about the game. But find him, and it was the right option once again. Thurston bloody makes the right decision, and um, that's why he's paid the big boy. And, th and that was it. It was down the to the dying minutes. I, like even a few seconds leading up to that, I still felt as if that feeling of like shit, mm. that we're going to lose this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as we scored. You could just see Brisbane Broncos. This momentum's down, massive in sport, gone, isn't it? And yeah. they just yeah. they all just collapsed. Um, Darius Boyd collapsed. And at that point in time, obviously Thurston had the kick to win it. Should have got it. Should have gave it to a left footer. Yeah, well, <laughs> that would have been no. good. Could have been no the Queensland cowboy reason, couldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, 
no, there was no better man. To, there was no better man to do that um, than Jonathan Thurston. Um, but yeah, obviously that was the moment. Then I realised, okay, we, if whatever happens with this kick, we could still win the game. Yeah, yeah. and it was seeing the elation on Thurston's face. I think he, he won a grand final with the Bulldogs, but he wasn't as involved. He was a young yeah. man back there. I think he gave his he gave his medal he gave away. Medal away yeah. yeah, and yeah. I think for him to do that for his own people from his in his own state and what it meant to everybody on that field. I think it's hard to describe how, how amazing that feeling would be for, for a player. I think it's brilliant. The games so, that we come up against Broncos that year too were, it was like, because obviously it's their local derby now, obviously the Dolphins are involved now, but um, the two um, Brisbane teams, oh, Queensland teams, sorry, rivalry, and it was always coming down to golden point or one, one point or one try throughout that season. And... For it to be like you're saying, John Thurston to finish off a fairy tale ending against a, like a, a local derby was yeah, an unbelievable grand final and to be a part of. Just on that, I always remember back to Flash 2014 grand final, Kieran Cunningham saying, it was, Enjoy it because it goes like that. Enjoy the game because it goes like that. Now, the games itself and, and, and the medals that you win along the way are great, don't get me wrong. But for me, it's always been about, you know, we spoke about the journey, the you know, journey. the journey and, yeah. and, and, the, and the days after. Well, I want to know what was it like winning an NRL grand final? What were the days after like for Lockwood? Were you Frank the Tank? Yeah, Frank the <laughs> Tank, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, respect. Right, it was... Because um, those were always the good days. Well, yeah. When you win yeah. something. That's yeah. why you win, yeah. of course. Yeah, that's why you win, yeah. 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 Um, so but it, it, like it is a great feeling because, all the, like you said, all the, all the hard effort, all the games that you get through, all the adversity that you're facing and then... To find, and that, at the end of the day, that's what what all chasing. Like every team at the from coming in day one preseason sets a goal of, yeah, we want to we want to be be the ones to hold that trophy, and then to be the ones that do it is, and and with the mates that you've been with that whole career, that whole that whole season, is just an unbelievable feeling. But also to be a part of Cowboys' first ever uh, NRL trophy, that was something else as well. They're rugby league mad up in Townsville, aren't they? Unbelievably mad, um, crazy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you're going to tell us a story. And that, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't go too deep. Oh. And if you want to hear about it all, get Jonathan Thurston's book. Oh, is and, it? Uh, in yeah, yeah, I think I think he's put a little bit in there. Would I have enjoyed it? You would have enjoyed it, mate. <laughs> enjoyed it massively. But I think the best part about was going back to Townsville and and carrying that trophy around and and seeing the streets lined with. Um, Cowboy supporters, not only obviously Cowboy supporters, but at, like just rugby league supporters in general. And um, yeah, we did feel like rock stars. We got off the plane, didn't even touch our bags. We walked off. There was aisles full of people. Walked straight onto a, a bus, which I don't even know where the bus come from, but there was no rooftop bus, um, which was pretty cool. Um, and then yeah, done a little lap back to the stadium. And when we got to the stadium, it was just filled with fans. That was. Um, Dairy Farms or one three hundred small stadium at the time and um, yeah, unbelievable. I time. remember we had we had Paul Wellens on at the podcast. I think it was the first or second episode, and he said that I think it was after the World Club Challenge or one of the I might be the Challenge Cup last year. They had an open top bus parade. Was it last? Was it Challenge Cup last year? Challenge Cup twenty twenty one. Yeah, and he said to the players, he said rather than just dick around and enjoy yourself, just have a look at the people lining the streets yeah. and have a look at how much this means to them. Because when you put that jersey on, you need to remember how much you representing that town means to other people. And, and there'll be all different demographics of society, different walks of life. And they're all coming here because they believe in you and the club and what it means to them. So embrace it and, 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 and drink it in. I think, Flash, for me, that Challenge Cup open top bus thing was the, probably one of the moments, you know, when we caught towards the, the Gerard Arms and yeah, the yeah. flares. Well, the fl yeah. It felt like a footballer flash, you know. Yeah. I think, obviously, when you win the grand final, it's a case of the boys get together and then, you know, you know, the day after, most of them are there. Then the third day, you know, they, there's, there's only a handful there. And then that's it. You go away. Yeah. And then, and then, but that felt like a huge celebration, didn't it? Oh, now, whether it was because the club hadn't done it for 13 years and it was, but, you know, you speak to the, the old Saints players and it was that every year they were literally wasn't they yeah like, thou like thousands like not, like uh, all every every street we we drove down drove not down. that bus they were out in the gardens what about the kids the there kids was, rode the, the yeah, whole way there, there was these, these kids 20 <laughs> kids and they must have only been my my sons they yeah, must they have been young. 10 or 11 yeah. and they cycled all the, the, whole, the, way the whole way, way. Us, yeah the whole way 
and cool. it was just it was an incredible experience to be a part of Kutu on it and it and it was you know obviously you'd said there about the Queensland Cowboys doing the open top bus thing but I think you know certainly when I uh, finally kind of come to look back on my career those are those are moments that that, that are pretty incredible it was lucky to happen really then yeah, too wasn't absolutely. it because of obviously oh, COVID, COVID and, and stuff yeah, and yeah. I don't think we we're probably meant to do it but I'm I'm very grateful that we, we got to experience yeah, that no, moment it was, it was unbelievable now talk us through saying so what was what was the low what was the 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 the, the attraction that brought you to Super League and St Helens um at the time I yeah I was and, and another low point, I guess. Because yeah, you've been referenced <laughs> saying few, Set Helen saved your career. Yeah, saved yeah. my career, and that's um, pretty much what they did. I, in 2018, I was um, at a very low point. I had a, I had an opportunity at one point to um, in, at the end of 2016 to go to Roosters for for four years. <laughs> they offered me a four year deal, and um, Cowboys. This before they signed Tedesco. This is before they signed Tedesco, yeah, and they offered me a four-year deal, and um, I chose to stay with Cowboys. Cowboys only offered me a two-year deal, but at the time, we were very happy where we were. Um, we started a family there. My wife's parents just moved up, um, built a house and stuff like that, so we were very happy there at the time. And um, I, I thought, yep, two-year deal, go and play some good footy again and, and try and try and stay as well. But at the time. It, it didn't unfold like that. A few things went on, um, and um, obviously they weren't looking to re-sign me. But then you, you never know what happens in rugby league. You never know who you never know who's talking or <laughs> under the table or anything like that. And um, next minute there was um, court wind that Benny Barber was wanting to come back to the NRL, and um, and just so happened to be he was, he was going to Cowboys and. I didn't know at the time because it was a late late decision. It was late in the year. I think it was around um, August or something like that. There was, there was talks and there was no NRL sort of opportunities coming up at the time. And I thought I was just, uh, that was it for me. I was, I was either going to go back to Q Cup or um, do something like that. Um, and I, I was second guessing my own ability as well. Um, I, you know, I wasn't... I, I was that down on confidence that I I didn't realise that I, I thought I was I was 28 at the time and I thought that was it I thought okay well maybe my my career's done and I've I've played my best footy and that they're behind me um, and that's where I got to at a point and brings me back to my point of um, how much of a coach has an influence on a player and then anyway that all unfolded and then realised that um, this op opportunity at Saints has come up uh, I spoke to my wife. Didn't want a bar of it <laughs> at the time. Um, took took some convincing, and only because I, I I took her away. We're both from Windsor. I took her away from her family um, first and foremost, and then her family. Her mum and dad moved up, and then I'm taking her away again. So it, it's always hard. There's always the some long contract negotiations with your wife. Yeah, with my wife. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. pretty much. Um, Take to Paris. Or, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe they've gone to London. And, and that's, I think people don't realise that's that how side. I sold it. Oh, yeah, really? they don't think... realise that, that 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 it's not just you. It's you know you've said you started a family and everything. Mm. I mean, like, how 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 difficult really was it? Oh, it, it, it's hard. It's hard at the time, and and especially for my wife. We're only young. Like I, um, like I said, I was I was twenty eight. Um, and she's she was 27. So, um, but yeah, it, it was hard. But um, at the time, yeah, trying to sell it to her of like you know we can travel Europe. We've got the opportunity. Um, obviously, you can't do that much travelling. But she didn't know <laughs> that. Don't realise. We've got every. Got we're you. playing every week <laughs> until October. Yeah. So yeah. So, yeah and um, in saying that, yeah, like I said, it was at the time. Like again, leaving Pemrith was was very sad and very hard, but not realizing what was it, what light ahead for me at the time. Now you you work with obviously um, Justin Holbrook, Christian Wolf. What were they both like to be coached by in terms of similarities, differences? What was your experiences like with both of them? Well, you can. You want to make a comment on Kyle's that? Coming, <laughs> no, come on, just, Kyle's got all no, the. They, they were, um, and like I said, that, and that was the best thing for me. At the time, didn't realise it, but since moving over, done a pre-season under Justin and it was unbelievably good. And especially the team that I come to as well. I came to a team of like-minded like, like -minded people, like 
hardworking winners. winners and just dedicated to not and not worried about putting their body on the line for 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 your teammates and that's who I love to play with and that's what Saints were go on Christian Justin yeah look look two two incredibly you know fantastic coaches both very very different in the styles I think that's obvious for me you know Justin Albrook was the the best coach that I've had I think what he did at the town was you know we talked about stars aligning all, all the ingredients coming together but he was he was he was incredible, wasn't he? And and every day you would walk in and he would be you know, him and the staff. They just had a smile on the face. They were almost you know looking back now, it was probably manufactured. You know that he probably said to the staff, make sure that you you're smiling and you're energetic and you know. And he had such a laugh. I mean, I, he was. I, I used to. I mean, we, me and <laughs> yeah. we used to go out. And Wound we, you up a fair yeah, bit, didn't yeah, yeah. yeah, but <laughs> that's not hard. But, do, no, it? well, no. <laughs> I think that was to create the energy course, almost. Yeah, and no, it obviously no one. Your misery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What did he do? No, no, it was just a good laugh. You know, he was just, you know, obviously he, he, he'd give me some some jip and I'd give him some back as well. And, you know, but really what he was, what his ability was, which was incredible, was he was uh, able... What are you laughing at there? Nah, <laughs> just the, the one comment, uh, you'd, you'd tell it better because I'm not the best at telling stories, but the comment around like the Challenge <laughs> Cup stuff from when it got real hot and the sun was out. Oh, but, yeah. Well, so, so, so we had, we had, the, we had this training session. It. it was the last run through before... Um, the last run through before the game and and it was red hot that day and 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 he always he always would use me as an yeah, example he wouldn't he yeah. but he'd get his point across but he was he, 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 as brilliant as the coach he was he was a mad stresser as yeah, well wasn't yeah, he yeah 100% like, he always thinking you know, so he'd say oh look like the sun's shining out today and I, I want to make sure that, you, that, that you're all hydrated. You know, I don't want to be having to hear about, you know, my, my, I don't know, but Marrow walking around Billings with his shirt off, high-fiving all the fans saying, how good are the Saints? Because <laughs> 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 you, you do that. Yeah. You do <laughs> do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking around, lads going, what the on about? You know, going, but I think, yeah, that's well, like, he knew that Marrow wouldn't do that. that. He knew that Marrow took the banter well. Yeah, but I think yeah. to get the point off, we're all laughing. And, and no, create he, energy. He, but he'd use me a number of times, yeah. wouldn't he? But you know what? What he was. But what, he understood your personality. Of course he did. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's what I was, that's just, smart. That's what I was yeah. just about Sorry. to get you. Right. He he would know how to get you up for a game, you up for a game, me up for a game, and he'd know how to work each individual. He'd know whether one would need a, a rocket up their ass or an arm round them, yeah. or you know, mm. like what you said with that inter uh, that, that, that that intercept. He, yeah, he, mm. I guessed it. Emotional he, intelligence. He he mm. was he was brilliant at that. And where we'd sort of, you know, Christian Wolf, he just didn't have a day off. Like yeah. his, his intensity was <laughs> intensity. another level. Yeah. And we needed that, you know, we needed that. And he certainly gave us that backbone that we needed. You know, the one, the one eyebrow around our time under Justin was, was that we weren't resilient enough in, in some big intense games that, that, that if a team got on top of us, we, we, we had a vulnerability about us. Mm. And I think what Wolfie did was, was again, through his, you know, you, you, you could have a bad training session flash and he'd pull you in and say, are you telling me you don't want to play this week? Like, and you're like, Jesus, mate, like, <laughs> come on, we all have a bad day. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, I think under Justin Holbrook, like, and what you talk about that resilience sort of thing, I think the big turning point was the Challenge Cup mm. final. Yep. In 2019, losing it against again against it Warrington, Warrington, yeah, yeah, like, and I know, think that's know, and, uh, knowing that we were sitting at that point, probably what ten points above everyone <laughs> in the Super League, and that I think that was a turning point to realise. And then obviously the year before, he's lost the, the Warrington the, the, again, again, Warrington in, again in against the final. Yeah, yeah. So there was this like inkling of like, oh, Saints can't come up. Was there a Catalan semi-final as well? Oh, that was... Was that... Oh, that's 7 No, 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 no. That, well, I can't, was that 2017? Yeah, it might have yeah, been, yeah. It might have been 2017. We got ambushed that day. Yeah, I remember... Well. Yeah, well, I, yeah, think, yeah we, I, think I think that we was won the 14 one, yeah. in a row, 10 or 10 or 12 yeah. games in a row. And I think what I'm trying to say is, I think under Christian Wolf, we didn't... You weren't allowed to go into a game thinking you were going to win. Nobody had the right to go yeah. into a game and yeah. win. That was probably what you needed after a couple so. of good years with Justin. Mm. Yeah. yeah. To like, there's no time to rest on your laurels. No. Yeah. It's really sleeves up even more mm -hmm. to, to continue this success. But yeah. then I also think Wolfie Christian learnt stuff from going to Saints and sort of learning how to relax and, and be serious 
because I feel like he was just serious the whole time. When he first and it's probably out, the way he looks as well. He yeah, looks like right. a serious I was, man. I was a bit scared. There was times where I've had conversations with him and just said, mm. like, mate, just smile a little yeah. bit more. Like, um, <laughs> I oh. hope he doesn't hear this. But <laughs> <laughs> No, but that's what, but, no, he's right. Yeah. He, was, he was that intense. It was like, mm. you know, you have to lighten up. And let's not forget, you know, before lockdown, he was under pressure. Mm. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, really under pressure. Yeah. yeah, and I think in lockdown, you know, he kind of learns how to trust the trust the boys and trust that they were good hard professionals, work. yeah, good hard professional. working. Yeah. Do you know what? After lockdown, we we were struggling. At, before lockdown, we were struggling at Salford a little bit, and then we came back and got to the Challenge Cup final. We had a really good run, and it's because we were a very professional group of lads off the field. And I think that told, and I think it was the same with you guys because you were all competitive, you were winners, you did the right mm. thing. I think that period of being away from training, it set the, the men from the boys and who were really, really like fair income yeah. about um, having a good season. I think sometimes, Flash, though, we still, we still get caught up in, in rugby players trying to pretend that they're all mad. You know, yeah. like, uh, is it, is it, like, it's not cool to be professional. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. think those attitudes are changing now. I yeah. think they are. But, you know, that Saints team, when you've got right at the very top of it all, when you've got James Roby, yeah. Leading by example. You look at Wigan Warriors, you've got Liam Farrell. John uh, you, you, do, yeah. do you know what I mean? And, and it's no coincidence, Flash, why those teams go on and, and achieve things. And I think Cootie will probably go into this later on down the line about Hull KR, but I think that's probably, you know, one thing with Willie Peters, obviously, and, and yourself being there, you'd, you'd pass that, that yeah. lose the tag of it's, you know, yeah. you don't have to pretend you're mad. The game 100%. is a tough game and you yeah. have to be slightly mad to play it. I get yeah. that. But we, you know, you don't, yeah. you don't need to. You don't you know, need the world too mad. It, it, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. not if you want to win things. No, that's very true. <laughs> there was um, Damien Hughes, the sports psychologist. He coined the phrase "cultural architects." Was that a good coach gets three or four cultural architects in a squad, whereas they set the culture. They're the leaders. They're the the, the main men that set that culture. And I think all good rugby league teams of the last 10, 10, 15 years have got those characters because lads will follow them. They'll, mm. fo like, they'll follow the Robies, they're all Auckland's, the Sinfields, the Peacocks. Yeah, well, Ro Roby definitely made me a better leader. And I think, I don't know if Roby said it or Robe said it or someone said it, but he said that he wasn't sure he could be a good captain because he didn't really speak much. And he showed me that the way to lead is through your actions. And that definitely sat with me more in leading through my actions than... than having something to say or trying to inspire players through your words, inspire yeah. them through your actions. Yeah, that's very true. Now, so looking back on your career at Saints, what were the, the big moments and who were the, the key you know, personalities, the key people in the dressing room that maybe got unnoticed a little bit, but who really added lots of value? You don't have to say, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think everyone. I like... Everyone in, in that team was was a real professional and, and wanted to succeed and um, they like they wanted their their what like people talk about the why and like if if your why is strong enough then you'll do anything to try and create um, success within your business or or professional rugby league career or anything like that um, but I felt like everyone's was um, had had the same idea and wanted to breed success within within that culture and I think it was a, a great culture there wasn't there wasn't like I come from Cowboys where you know there was a it was a massive drinking culture um you know we're, we're on trips away all the time and I, I find you know probably sometimes you just deal with things through alcohol which is which is not the answer which I've now found um but going to Saints was probably the best yeah like, like I've said it before but the best thing that's happened to me in as an individual but then also the, the, the culture that I went into created that. So like, obviously like Johnny Lomax made me a, a better professional with what he does. He's the more professional his, guy. Before yeah. his, He's with his bottle, body, so. He'll be stretching right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 definitely. Without doubt. I swear yeah. we had comp competitions and trying to see who was first into training. Like, I'll be like, I'll be running in, racing in, trying to race him in there, but. But yeah, Johnny Lomax, um, and then being at, like with Tio Farge as well. Me and me and him really clicked, and I think he was a a great um, reason why why we went so well. We had that stability within our team of just like not doing the flashy plays, but making sure that everyone knew their role and um, and we're getting to the points of the field.
I, I, yeah, I, I think it was detail me. You know, everybody mm. knew their role and everybody nailed it more often than not. And even your, you know, I always think the the, the, the teams that, that win things, I do believe that you need three, three, maybe four slight egos, slight mavericks in a team. You know, the ones but who, are, well, look, the, the ones Al who are going to come up with, with yeah. uniqueness are the ones who provide something that's different. You have to have them and you have to, a coach has to massage that as well at times. But I think, you know, predominantly, if you've got though, you're always going to get three or four, you know, special players that do their own thing. But I think everybody else, as long as they sit in the realms of knowing what they're good at, and don't try and be the, the that, hero that was of the team. That, it? Yeah. Well, exactly. But yeah, I, I honestly think that the best sides are the ones who let, you know, let's, you know, if you talk about that, that Melbourne side, the, the, the spine of that, everybody else just fitting it around it. And I think, I think everyone think that now the best teams are the ones who, who, this is what you do. Don't try and do anything over it and don't try and be anything or don't drop underneath it because we'll put somebody else in. And if you, as long as they sacrifice their ego for the greater good of the team, then, then it works, doesn't it? Because, you, you know, special players will always come. You know, the next group will come along again and, and, they, and they, they just are. I don't know how they do it, but they just do. But I think that, I think it's saying what you had at the time was you had a lot of those, um, a, a lot of the key individuals were in the sort of the, the peak years of the career. Uh, and I think you had a lot of clubmen, if you like, who would who, who probably could have earned money better money elsewhere, but, but realised they were in something special. And, and ultimately, under all, under all of that, there was a willingness and, and, and want to, to succeed and, and be very fit. And you know, one thing you had to be at Saints was fit, wouldn't you? Yeah, you had fit, to be, yeah. you know, you didn't get respect from the boys if you, if you tossed training off. And, um, you know, I think, I think as well, a special mention for the blokes that didn't always play. You know, I think, yeah. I think we had a really had good. A good depth. A, you've got a to be really good, 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 good team yeah. to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy being in and out of a team, out of a team, and still offering the services and being supportive to the lads who are, who are taking the field. That you need good club men around there. Yeah, right? yeah. And you have to want to. You have to want to do the right thing by throwing the best shape at, at, at the first thirteen or yeah. whatever. And 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 I think you know at what Saints have been able to do is is constantly provide that that next wave. And all of them look. All of them may not go on to make a first team game, but the attitude and and the expectation of them is set out early on that whether you're playing or not, you train to your absolute best. Otherwise, you don't get respect. Otherwise, you, yeah. It's a good recipe for success, though. Right, so let's talk Rovers, Hull KR. What, what attracted you to, 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 to sign for to Hull KR in 2022? Um, there was a little bit of still wanting to play, and I think, like, go back to trying to convince the wife to go over to, to England and stuff like that. It was always a case of, right, we play three years. I'll go there for three years, and, and then we come back to Australia. And that was sort of always the plan. But when I got to Saints, it was like, geez, I'm loving this. I could stay here for five years or whatever it might be. Um, and I used to throw it in there every now and then, every new, do you reckon we could stay another year after this? Like, <laughs> just <Is> she <laughs> just to the wire. Oh, she has. It? Well, COVID ruined it a lot. Yeah. Um, we, ha we had some tough periods through COVID and stuff like that, which, everyone, which everyone yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then obviously the fact of being on the other side of the world and all that kind of stuff comes into play. So... Um, yeah, so the, the plan was to try and um, stay for three years and then go home. But then, obviously, I wanted to stay at Saints. Um, at the time, we were, we were looking to negotiate another contract and um, and that this is the good thing about Saints. Um, loyal to the, to the guys that they bring through. You know, now they're, they're playing great footy and they're, they're one of the best in the Super League with Lewis Dodd and, and Jack Wellsby. And unfortunately, uh, that's part of the game. Um, when you've got such a good team f playing well, everyone's performing well, someone's going to lose out. And unfortunately, it was me. Um, and there's no, there's no bad blood there at all. I knew the circumstances and I've experienced it. I experienced it over in yeah, Cowboys. I've, I've, I've been that. around, yeah. It's, it's and just the case of a salary cap sport, isn't it? Just, you, yeah. When you get the emergence of a young quality talent like Jack Wellsby, they start commanding more money. Something has to give. Yeah, something, something has to give. And then I got offered a, a year to stay at Saints, um, but like a transition sort of year. Um, and at the time, I, I could have stayed, but I, f I felt like I was I was more hungry. You I was still hungry. Give. I still had more to give. I still felt like I was playing good good rugby. And I felt like, well, 
can I get something back in the NRL? So we were looking everywhere for everything. And then, um, fortunately enough, KR come in. Obviously, the wife wanted to go home, but um, they come Pools in. Pools by the sea, though, isn't it? Like, yeah, I was yeah. Say, <laughs> if it took some convincing oh, the to, to move, uh, I didn't want to say that. Queensland to St. Allen's about it took a bit more to go. <laughs> hey, hey, it's not I'm too gonna, bad. It's not too bad over there. Well, I've enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's been really good. Um, but yeah, they they come in with a good deal, um, two years, which I originally wanted that at Saints as well. Um, but unfortunately, that obviously those reasons. Um, but then, yeah, it was. I seen it as another challenge to to be successful, and um, I seen it as similar to Cowboys. Go to Cowboys, be the first ones to win a premiership uh, or a championship, um, and that was that was the overall goal, and that's that's the end game that I had in my head to go go to whole KR and um, and and bring them a, bring them a trophy. Cootie, so you join all KR. You've come from St. Allen, three grand finals and a Challenge Cup in your time there. What was the biggest difference day one when you walked through? Uh, yeah, just the standards, definitely. Easy, easy answer. Um, standards of um, the, the culture, um, like I spoke about with Saints, it wasn't much of a drinking culture. Um, probably was behind the scenes, I didn't know. <laughs> Don't tell Kuti. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going to the Some of that. No comment. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but Don't I think, yeah, honest. just the standards and um, and I think Tony had done a good job as well. Then he he was in the process of sort of changing that and did you sign bring... for Tony to work for Tony or was I, I spoke with Tony and, yeah. and and he's another reason why I went there and I did like Tony as a character. I I never really met him um, face to face, but the way he come across is a good character. Is is always sort of like a positive up up sort of bloke, positive bloke. Um, so he was one of the reasons why I did go there, um, and then. Yeah, so that, but like, I'll just stick with standards at the moment. And was it was it alarming, or was it, you know, how how big was was the the difference between the two in terms of those standards? Then it was it was alarming. Um, I did have conversations with the wife and think about, and then like like even just moving the kids from St Helens and and stuff like that. Like all that comes into play, and then you sort of start questioning yourself: have have I made the right decision here in in coming here? But Again, like I could see, I could see potential, and like I had the focus and I had the drive, like I did with Saints. I've gone into Saints and, and try and contributed to to winning some trophies there, which was successful. Obviously, not because of me, but obviously the the culture in itself. But if I could try and rectify that and at uh, at KR and and make make these individuals realise how good they can be. And not wasting it just because of, you know, a, a night out or or something like that. And so I ch- like, I've pretty pretty much given up alcohol because not because of that, but I I know what it I know what it does to you, and I know how it, it can affect you. Um, so is that more health or uh, mental health or? and mental? So yeah. um, at Saints, I I didn't really drink that much. I drank a little bit, um, but then that was like sort of my my transition away from it and it was it, I'm just thankful that um, my wife doesn't really drink so it was easy not to do that at home and then and then when I got to KR I was right well I think I'm gonna have to not commit to not going out here and just try and be an example that I want to be and going back to James Roby like try and be the example that you want to be and, and be a leader and what it takes to be successful Talk about not drinking alcohol there, Cootie. Was there ever a point where you felt that it was getting a hold of you then, or is it...? Uh, yeah, I sort of liked who I was when I was pissed. And and that's a bad thing. I thought I could only be myself when I was um, under the influence of alcohol. Be yourself? Uh, yeah. Do you, so, have, do you have insecurities? Oh, uh, I, I used to, yeah, I used to. There's there's a there's a there's definitely a, a path that I went down um, of... and. Not not many people know this, no, um, no. but um, yeah, of sort of depression and stuff like that, and and dealing with everything. I'm lucky I didn't, um, yeah, keep going down that path, and I had good people around me. But I don't want to go too deep into it. But yeah, alcohol does consume you, and you and you feel like some. You get to a stage where you feel like you're a better person um, with alcohol, and that, and and it's not the answer. Was that a byproduct of the pressures of 
of sport or just something that's just oh i think so and and then just being around that culture as well and you sort of just get caught up in it um i had some sort of personal issues when i issues when i was younger that i was um that i was dealing with as well and i just got i got past those issues but then i think alcohol just became a, 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 yeah, a, yeah the culture and, and the and addic- an addiction it can be a coping mechanism can't yeah it? coping I, mechanism I, I, as well I've, i like a beer and a, a big night out and i think i get beer fear now for no mm. reason for the next mm. day if i've had a big night i'll be like scared of the shadow next to me just because <laughs> it's that anxiety and i think <laughs> Anxi- it's, yeah it's it's it does something to your brain and the, and the chemicals and stuff and i don't know whether you're a, a, f- a football fan but Deli Ali had a an, did an interesting interview with Gary Neville recently, where he he had a, a bit of childhood dr- trauma in his life, and it led to him he had a horrific childhood um, using alcohol and sleeping tablets as a coping mechanism, and he he went from superstar footballer to a bit of a laughing stock because nobody knew what was going on in his private life, yeah. and he went from a superstar footballer to a laughing stock of a player because he was dealing with all these pressures and it was because he used alcohol and sleeping tabl- tablets as his coping mechanism. Mm. And he was affecting his, his whole life. And yeah, some people, it, it's, 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 it's not good stuff, is it? No, no. no. And uh, so do, do, do you feel that the, that the game or, you know, you talked about saying sort of saving your career. I'm just listening to what you've been saying. Is it perhaps a little bit more than just your career then, Cooey? Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that, would, and like, I'll, I talked about I talk about it with my wife at the moment uh, that moving over here, not just because of the success that I've had, it's realizing about finding who I am as a person, and it's made me realize it's taken me away from my friends and family over there, and I've had the time to really think about who I am and and what my values are and and think about myself and and yeah, it has it's it's definitely helped my relationship and my wife's relationship it's helped massively with all those things and like we were never in a bad way but I just never realized how good it could get and moving over here was the best thing that's ever happened to us off the field as well not only on the field so um and yeah just going back to sort of KR and just trying to I've realized how much being away from alcohol has made me a better person and I know that um, that I could create I'll try and create that within the KR culture um, so yeah choosing not to go out or anything like that and um, and you get segregated a bit like you, you're like oh probably don't tell Cootie because you know he, he might tell someone and that's not what it was about it was never I don't care what you're doing it like that's your choice to go and do that but if you're choosing to do that, then you're harming yourself and you're, and you're harming the team's performance as well because you're not going to be at your best on Monday. Do you think your decision to kind of abstain from alcohol and, and probably be as professional as you could be, did that rub off on some of your teammates, do you think? Uh, I think it might. I liked, I'd like to think so. Mm. Um, and it, it wasn't just about staying away from alcohol as well. It was about obviously doing what I needed to do to be better and I was still learning I'm like I was still learning now like just before I retired like I'm still learning every day to try and get better and and how to be a better rugby player how to be a better teammate how to help make my teammates better um and it was all about being the most professional I can be and and being in a good mood about it like being smart and like going back to probably um Justin Holbrook like it's probably fabricated a bit like it was it's probably fake and you're convincing yourself that you're happy about rocking up on Monday and, and being not sore or whatever or trying to pretend that you're not sore. But it was all around to try and make myself better as an individual but also how can I make the culture better as well. Well, look, I think, I think you know, and I know we always can't rely on social media to tell us the absolute truth, can we? But I think, you know, when you did you announce your retirement, the number of messages that came in, you know, the the, the images of the, the guys at OKR applauding you, everyone at the club, the crowd all behind you. I think it's safe to say you've had a pretty cool impression on, on, on not only the club, but the supporters, all the stakeholders who were involved with it. And uh, yeah, no, it was just brilliant. See, I know how, I know how much of an impact that you had uh, on, on, 
you know, St. Helens, uh, you know, it was incredible to play alongside you. And I know how much of an impact that I, I've no doubt that if you hadn't have been there, you know, things may, you know, things may have been a bit different. So, uh, you know, for what you've just been saying there, mate, you know, outstanding. And, and I'm, I'm sure you've had a, a positive impact on everyone at KR. Yeah, those kind of, um, that reception to retirement isn't, isn't common. So I think that shows a lot towards what, what kind of impact you had on the club in such a short period of time. So, you know, I should be con uh, con congratulated for that massively. Now, we just want to discuss your, your retirement a little bit and um, and hear your thoughts on it. Because, um, you know, you're still a young man and obviously you look, you're physically quite fit and healthy, and, but there's been a few um, issues with concussion. Um, so how do you, first of all, how do you feel about your retirement and, and how long has it, has it been a consideration for you? Um, well, at the end of the day, it's inevitable that we all have to retire. And I think, like, knowing that I've been close to it a couple of times, I knew that, um, righto, this, this two-year deal with KR could possibly be, that's it, I'm going home. Obviously, I didn't think of concussion at the time, but I knew that, you know, the family have supported me enough to try, throughout my career. I've been pretty selfish as an individual, which you do at time, you have to at times, um, to be professional. Um, so I knew that it was sort of coming to an end. Um, but yeah, obviously it come to an end earlier than, than what we thought. Um, I announced my retirement at the end of this year, earlier in the season, and then coming out and, and getting another two concussions this year um, didn't help. And that was the that was the frustrating thing going like from last year coming into this season, knowing that if I get any more concussions, then you know it's it, there's some t tough conversations to be had and. I think I took the frustration out. We we played a friendly match against um, Leeds, and Aiden Caesar, I, I slipped and he he hit me high, and there was so much frustration in myself knowing that if I got concussed, then then I'm considering I haven't even started the year and it's all over, and I lashed out and and Few slapped. Humbugs. Yeah, <laughs> wasn't wasn't a close fish, but fist, but open hand, um, but yeah. I apologised to him after the game and, and I, it was just myself really, it was nothing he did. It was my reactions and my frustration taking it out on him. So, um, But yeah, it was, yeah that, it's been a tough year. At that point, did you know that there was pressure from medics and team doctors for you to kind of, you were on your last warning in a way? Was it? Was there external kind of... Oh, there was heaps. I had, had a, um, obviously, the concerns of the wife, of the family, um, the concerns from yes, medical staff. I've I've seen the head specialist five times in the last two years. He was we're, we're, we're counting up how many head knocks I've had over my 15 year playing like playing career. Um, so it's just like all those things come into play, and knowing that like I, I just want to finish this year. I just want to. I knew that we had a great preseason. I knew that we had a good team. We recruited well. Willie's been fantastic and I knew that there was there was something special coming from this season and to feel like yeah and like I said all that frustration come out with that one head knock with the in in the early part of the season. Cooey, what was the what was the first time where you felt or the club felt that you needed to see a specialist and how did that conversation go? You mentioned the five times. What, what when was the uh, when was it first noticed that 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 you could potentially be in a bit of trouble here. Mm. And how did that conversation go and how did you feel? Well, it was, yeah, it was tough. I, it was at the end of last year. Um, I, had, I had three concussions um, throughout that season and it was towards the back end when things were sort of going pear-shaped with our team. We weren't performing too well. Obviously, Tony Smith had left and all those kinds of things were happening. But I was obviously, I had a couple of concussions throughout that year early on and then um, in, the, in the late in the back half of that season. So I was working closely with Gemma, our doctor, um, and she had mentioned like, every time I had a concussion, I had to go to the speci specialist to sort of sign off to say that, you know, I'm playing um, at my own will, knowing the risk and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, seeing the specialist and obviously he was concerned as well. He was concerned about um, how many concussions I've had throughout my career all the research coming out about it all. Um, so, and like I said, like, and like I said, going into this season, 
I was nervous in a, in a way, knowing that if I get any more concussions, then that could be it. Or the right thing to do was to walk away from the game. Did it, did it play on your mind going into a game or a training session, a contact session or a big game? Did you think, shit, I need to be careful here? Yeah, well, I had numerous conversations with um, Willie Peters about it all. Um, and he... He stressed the con he he had massive concerns about it all as well. So he obviously knows um, the repercussions of concussion and all that. Um, so he had his concerns around it. Um, but yeah, he's. But yeah, I did. To be fair, I had. Um, I was yeah thinking about it at like not in the early stages because I had a really good preseason. I was probably I was really fit. Everything w was going well. No 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 issues throughout the preseason. But going into the season, in the back of my mind, knowing that. You know, if I got any more concussions, then that could potentially be me. So magic weekend, um, where you, you know, your last sort of concussion, mm. put me in flash in the room with the specialist. Were you on your own? Were you with your wife? What did he say? Um, that was a yeah, that was a hard conversation. And I think from that concussion, walking off the field, having in my head that this could be it, like. This is it. And I think there's going to be some real tough conversations after this conversation, not only for the specialist, but with my wife as well. Um, so, yeah, that, that three-week period of gathering all the information about concussion, um, for me as an individual, going to get brain scans in, in Manchester, uh, making sure that I had all the information, um, contract, contract situation, all the information together before I made... A decision on whether to continue on or whether to stop playing and that dis discussion with the specialists um yeah got me got me real bad because i i was hoping i was i had some sort of hope that oh i might be all right or i'll be okay to to finish off the rest of the season and and go into the semi-final challenge cup and and try and chase another trophy I was just hoping that there was something that the specialist said that gave me that glimpse of being like, okay, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, but there wasn't. <laughs> I think we've all been in those meetings with doctors and specialists where they say, your season's done. Mm. But to go from season done to career done, yeah. that must be tenfold difficult to, to listen to. Yeah, and I, and I wasn't, and it's not as if they forced me into the decision. They just gave me all the information that I needed to try and make a a decision around my health and what were the um, what's the reward for going forward and, and playing versus your health for 20 years down the track and when they put that into perspective of like you know you've got four months left you're chasing something that you've you've held before um, which which is hard to cop because all we want to do is just keep chasing more chasing more um, so he put those into perspective and then and then my wife sitting next to me as well. So as soon as he, he laid all that out, I just had this feeling that came to me and I was like, okay, right, that's it. The hope had gone and I, I broke down in tears. So mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> still hard to try and get me grip, uh, like, like come to terms with it. But yeah, my wife was sitting next to me. She was crying, I was crying. Um, and it was just hard to know that, you know, my son... <laughs> I wasn't going to get to put the jersey on again and run out in front of my family. Yeah. And then to stand up there in, in front of the boys and tell them that I'm not going to be able to take the field with them anymore mm. was, was, a hard, it was hard to get my head around. Mm. And... It, there's still emotion around it now and, and still hard to sort of come to terms with it. So um, I, I did all that. I did all the conversations and, and it was very tough. But um, at the end of the day, usually the hardest decisions are the right ones and I think I've made the right decision. Yeah. And there's, um, there's a famous saying by Dr. Seuss that's, don't be sad that it ended, be happy that it happened. Mm. I think, you know, it's tough now. It's very raw for you, obviously, and I can understand why I've... I've been there, um, but I mean, you've got one of your former teammates who will 
wax lyrical about you on and off the field. I think you can be incredibly proud of what you've done both mm. over here and in Australia. Like I said, to win a grand final in both comps is, there's a handful of people who've done yeah. that. And to leave a mark on, on KR in such a short period of time and have all the people on, on the terraces at St. Helens singing your name, it's, um, yeah, yeah you've, you've, I think you've left a serious mark on the Super League, mate. You should be very proud of yourself. And that's what I've, I've tried to look at. Um, and then going back to the mental state side of things, I knew my career was coming to an end eventually. So, and I knew that previous players had struggled with retirement. So my last probably three years was to focus on how can I be in the best mental state I can for retirement. And I'm so happy that I'd, I'd worked really hard to figure out who I was and, and what I'm about. Um, because w as rugby league players, we tie our identity to rugby league and that's who we are. But I've worked really hard over the last three years to try and uh, find out who Lachlan Coote is away from rugby league or who I am as a person and not just not just tied to rugby league. So it was, yeah, and I'm, I'm glad I've done all that because it's definitely helped and put me in a, in a better state now. Um, but then, yeah, going back to the original question of, being around KR and, and, and St Helens and all that kind of stuff. When you when you go to a place and you've got a sense of belonging, you'll do anything for that club. And that's how I felt at Saints and, and that's how I, I felt at KR as well. I think that's you know pretty powerful listening to what you've been saying. I think there's a lot of players who can resonate with that. You spoke about how you over the last three years, you're trying to find out who Lachlan Coote is right at the very start. Flash, I said now, I still don't quite know what I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going. So it's incredibly, you know, refreshing to hear that that, that you've not only have you delivered on the field, but you've certainly delivered as, as a person as well. And, uh, you know, to echo what Flash said, mate, you know, to be one of only 14 to, to both sides of the world, a Challenge Cup in there, three, three grand finals, dream teams, international caps, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that you've <laughs> that you've conquered the game, mate. So yeah, you've won. Uh, you've won. You've won. You won. You won. No one, one wins. One few, no, no one wins. No one wins. But you know, I, I, again, you know, you only have to mention this guy's name in the town of St Helens, and I'm sure in years and years to come. I've no doubt that that hopefully one day you can you, you can come back across and and we can all share a beer again and talk about the memories and and I've no I've no doubt that or a fanner that say again or a fanta, fanta. Not a bit. Or, or, or <laughs> fanta. sorry of course fanta. yeah of I'm course, joking, mate. Of course. i still enjoy uh, a red wine yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. there you go yeah. so yeah no mate brilliant and it's been an absolute privilege to sit on this sofa and and, and talk through it and, and even though we played three years together learn mm. things that even i didn't know no. you know so yeah. uh thanks for sharing mate no thank and you and just before we finish what's next come on tell us tell us um, what, what, what we're, get excited about <laughs> i think uh yeah we definitely Moving back home. Oh, I don't. I don't mean to say definitely. You can travel to Paris now. You oh, can finally yeah. yeah. uh, do his end of I can find it. Yeah, <laughs> we can finally travel Europe. Um, have you got any? Have you got any plans to travel before you go back? Yeah, or, yeah, we yeah. do. So, uh, I'm I'm fortunate enough and really really grateful that KR have um, have been very supportive with with my decision. Um, which I'll just touch on that. That um, Paul Lakin and, and Neil Hudgel back at the club, like they've been awesome. For me, off the field as well, you know, I've, I've caught up with um, Neil numerous times of, over coffee, and we've had chats and stuff. And he's helped me um, help me deal with things away from rugby league, like in terms of like professional business wise and all that kind of stuff. So he's been awesome. And then obviously making that retirement, they've obviously um, you know looked after me f until the end of the year, um, which I, which I'm very grateful for. And they you know they didn't really have to do that. Um, but yeah, that's allowed us to um, be able to finish comfortable and and go home and and move back, move the family back home, and and then probably do a bit of travelling ar around Europe as well. So back um, to Townsville. Back to Townsville. Yeah. Um, and then going to look into. I, I enjoy property. Um, invested in a, in, a, in in myself in property. So I'm going to move into. Uh, I've been a real estate agent. Nice. And then learn the art of sales. Um, you'd be good off that. <laughs> Talk underwater, you can so. <laughs> Billy bullshit. So I might, um, might ask you a few questions after this, but <laughs> it's not small; it's cosy. <laughs> yeah. 
power of storytelling. We all, <laughs> yeah. uh, we all have the power to do mm. it. So, yeah, but we'll, we'll move back to Townsville. Um, we, we, you know, we, we sort of ended um, our time not like not the way we wanted to Quite in Townsville. Abrupt. Yeah, so we, we want to go back there and, and, and settle there for a bit, go back around, being around family, Laura's parents, the in-laws. Are they still there waiting for They're us? They're still there back? waiting for us, hanging on. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, nah, it'll, um, it'll be good. Looking forward to it. And I think, um, like we spoke about all those things, about um, realising who you are and, you know, rugby league has been a massive part of my life and I've played it since I was eight years old. And But at the end of the day, there's life after rugby and, you know, we can all be better in in careers and whatever we choose, I think, be successful. And the more and more I'm asking questions that from previous people that have retired, like yourselves, how you can create or how much things translate into, into life after football. And that's given me confidence to know that, you know, I'll be OK. Mate, I'm sure you'll be. You'll be more than OK you know, after all you've achieved and... That the the relationships you've made over here, you'll you'll be a, you'll be a massive success. So I think that's all, is it, Kyle? Anything you want to finish on? I think so. No, it's been good to have you. It's been it's been a, it's been enjoyable, Flash. I've, I've really enjoyed it, and obviously we've had a you know a great guest in Cootie. You've you've opened up, and it always helps when you know when when people are you know I remember listening back to a podcast that you did with our physio uh, Nathan Mill, and it was around the sort of stigmas of of of, uh, of masculinity and, mm. and, and and admitting that, that that you do cry, you are open to being vulnerable, and I think you've displayed that today, and 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 as such, we've been able to not only delve into you as the player but again you as the person and and you know I've certainly learned uh, one or two things uh, that that I'll take away and again I'll I'll uh, I'll like to thank you for for sharing all those pal it's been it's been pretty cool to listen to you yeah, yeah. thank you very much cheers Lachlan thanks cheers, for having me on cheers. right that's that's all for this week guys please like subscribe add any comments and five star reviews only hopefully Will Perry will still be on holiday next time. <laughs> Thanks a lot for uh, watching and listening.